Good morning, Dr. Ng, Ng Yen Yen, and uh, brothers and sisters of the Dharma. Today we have uh, uh, Dr. Ng with us to talk about Mahaparinibbana Sutta. But before that, let's go and uh, do our chanting for the morning. Salutation to the Triple Gem. Let us pay respects to the Triple Gem. Arahang Sama Sambuddha Bhagawa Buddha Bhagawantang Abhiwademi Swakato Bhagawata Dhammo Dhammang Namasami Supati Panno Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Sangang Namami. Let us pay homage to the Buddha. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa We chant the verses for taking the three refuges Buddhang saranang gachami Dhammang saranang gachami, sanggang saranang gachami, dutiampi buddhang saranang gachami, dutiampi dhammang saranang gachami, dutiampi sanggang saranang gachami. Tatiampi buddhang saranang gachami Tatiampi dhammang saranang gachami Tatiampi sanggang saranang gachami We chant these verses to observe the five precepts Panatipata veramani sikapadang samadhyami Adinadana veramani sikapadang samadhyami Kamesu michachara veramani sikapadang samadhyami Musawada Veramani Sikapadang Samadhyami Surameraya Majapakmadatana Veramani Sikapadang Samadhyami Let us recollect the sublime qualities of the Buddha. Iti piso bhagawa arahang sama sambutho Vija charana sampano sugato lo kawidu Anutaro purisadamma sarati Sata dewa manusanang Buddha Bhagavati. Let us recollect the sublime qualities of the Dhamma. Swakato Bhagavata Dhammo Sanditiko Akaliko Ehipasiko Opanaiko Pacata Veditabo Vinyuhiti Let us recollect the sublime qualities of the Sangha. Supati Pano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango 
Ujo pati pano bakawato sawaka sanggo Nyaya pati pano bakawato sawaka sanggo Samici pati pano bakawato sawaka sanggo Ya didang catari puri sayukani Atta puri sapukala Esa bhagawato sawaka sanggo Ahuneyo pahuneyo Dakineyo anjali karaniyo Anuttarang punyaketang lokasati Sadu, sadu, sadu Welcome Dr. Ng Yen Yen So today uh, Dr. Ng will speak on Mahaparinibbana Sutta from Digga Nikaya 16 Okay Today, this is uh, discussed by the, uh, the in, is found in the Dika Nikaya and it is found in number 16. So, it is a long uh, discourse and we are going to talk about the last days of the Buddha. So, as the Buddha's disciples, we want to know what were his last words so that we can keep in mind of his last words and then practice them. So we shall start because it's a long sutta and I hope to finish all these uh, 16 parts of the places that he traveled. So we go to the voucher peak first. The voucher peak is at Rajagaha. So all these places are at Rajagaha. And then all these places are at the Lichavi. And this is the Ganges River. So at Vouchers Peak at Rajagaha, we have the Buddha at Vouchers Peak. And the, the King Ajatasattu bid his minister, Vasakara, to go to the Buddha and ask the Buddha whether he would succeed in conquering the Lichavians, which who are very powerful. And he says, Go and ask whether I can destroy the Lichavians. And Vasakara, being the minister, obedient minister, went to the Buddha and asked these questions of the Buddha. So we know uh, that politicians ask the ascetics such questions about war and conquest and whether they will succeed or not. So anyway, Vasakara did that. And the Buddha then turned to Venerable Ananda, who was next to him, and asked whether the Lichavians, whether Lichavians uh, have uh, practiced the seven conditions of welfare. If they practice the seven conditions of welfare, then they will prosper and not decline. And the Rajagaha would not be able to destroy them. So, what are the seven conditions of welfare? So, these seven conditions of welfare for a country would be similar to any country, to any organization, for anything that wants to succeed. So, we bear in mind what the Buddha says. These seven conditions of welfare that they must meet, they must meet regularly. If you don't meet regularly, how to communicate? Right. So we must meet regularly. That's the first point. And when you meet, you must meet in harmony. During the meeting, there must be harmony. There shouldn't be fights. So there must be harmony. And after that, it must be also in harmony. And then he says the ancient laws. The ancient laws should not be abolished just as you wish. And that no new authority the law that is not uh, put up, be put up. So it should not be abolished. So, and that they must give respect to the elders in the organization. 
and they must not abduct the females and force them to stay with them. And that they have to uh, support the shrines locally and abroad. So if you go abroad, you must respect the strengths of other countries. And then to support the Arya Sangha. Okay, so these were the seven conditions of welfare. So this uh, Vasakara said, well, if they have they keep to one condition, Ajata Satu would not be able to bring them to Rin. If there are seven, it's unlikely that Ajata Satu were able to destroy them. So then he says, this wily Vasakara, the minister, then said that they would introduce dissent, introduce, enter, infiltrate into the Lichavians so that they have discord and disunity amongst themselves. So Vasakara then say he has much to do and took leave of the Buddha. After Vasakara has left, the Buddha called Ananda to call upon all the monks that were staying in Rajagaha to come and assembly at the vouchers peak. And then he went on to say how to have the conditions of welfare for the prosperity, for the flourishing of the Sangha with no decline, a minimal decline of the Sangha. So he went to talk about it further. So you notice, huh? you want to remember? You must remember MHA, Ministry of Home Affairs. You want to have harmony? You must have MHA. And you must respect the elders, the females, the strengths, and the Aryan monks. So this is something uh, that's very easy to uh, remember. So you keep this in mind so that you know how to uh, engage uh, the organization, your family, or the society that you are in. So now the Buddha then discussed these seven conditions of welfare to the Sangha because he wished for the Sangha to prosper. So what are these seven conditions? Similarly, it is this. For the seven conditions of welfare for the Sangha, it is same. They must meet regularly. So they have their party moka, they meet regularly. And they meet in harmony. And they do not abolish their ancient laws. So you must remember this, huh? they do not abolish their ancient laws. And that they respect the elder monks in the Sangha. And they must be able to restrain their sensual desires. Desires to restrain. So that they would not have rebirth. Then, for the shrines, uh, they tell the Sangha members to continue to live in forest lodgings. These are the shrines he sort of tell the Sangha. You must love forest uh, lodgings and that you must keep your personal mindfulness close to you. So it's very similar to that of the mundane life. So the Sangha similarly have to keep these seven conditions for the non-decline of the Sangha. So this is the first part. Then the second part, he says, that he, he makes it easier for the monks to remember. So in parts of seven, seven is easier for people to remember. Then he says seven, you must have faith And you must have moral shame if you have done anything wrong. And you must have moral fear of doing wrong. And you must uh, love learning and that you have vigor or energy. right? And then you must have mindfulness and wisdom. 
So this is the seven, con another set of seven, the second set of seven conditions of welfare. You must have faith, moral shame, moral fear of doing any wrong and that you love learning the Dharma and you are energetic in it and you must maintain your mindfulness and try to grow your wisdom. Then he will say, there are another seven things that you must not do. Okay? And what are the seven things that you must not do? You do not delight. So he says, do not delight. Okay? Do not delight in works. In evil desires, in evil friends, in partial achievement. That means if you are stream enterer, you must go for the higher. You must not be satisfied with just partial achievement. And that you sit on your laurels after you achieve a little bit thing. And that you should not delight in sleep and you should not delight in chattering nor in company he says if you delight in this then it will decline if you're so involved with works so to remember this uh, remember this acronym if you do this, uh, you will only whip CC, okay? W-E-E-P-S-C-C, -C. okay? So you will only whip if you do this, right? So then he says, you have to, another set of things that you have to do. He says, he says that another set of things, uh, is the seven factors of enlightenment. So we all know it's mindfulness, investigation, energy, uh, rapture, tranquility, concentration, and equanimity. So the seven conditions of, uh, seven factors of enlightenment. Or awakening. These seven factors of awakening is to awaken you to the path, to the practice. So these seven factors of enlightenment if enlightenment is a big word, then we will say seven factors of awakening. Then it goes, he then says another seven, uh, and that the other seven is seven perceptions. He says you must have these seven perceptions. These seven perceptions of impermanence. You must perceive you know, everything you see as impermanent. And that you must perceive non-self. Or foulness. And the danger. And then the escape. The dispassion and cessation. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. So these are the seven perceptions that he encouraged. So he says if you have these five, uh, five times seven uh, sets, uh, the Sangha will flourish and will not decline. This, then he says, for communal living, for communal living, you need six things. And what are the six things? He says you must have metta, loving kindness to uh, the fellow monks and everyone else, in private and public. It can be, it should not be uh, outside, huh? you show one face, and then inside, huh? you are a fierce person. It isn't like that. It has to be the same. Outside and inside is the same. In public and private is the same. And then he has said you must keep to the discipline. And then you must have the noble view. 
you must have the goal in mind. Nibbana, that's the only goal. Like, you know, the basketball court, uh, you only have that ring there, you need to put your ball into the, the uh, goal. So you must have that noble view in mind. And you have to have this discipline and noble views both in public and in private. So he says, in this way, you will have harmonious, harmonious communal living. So he tells them this. He reminds them this. And he continues to say that it is the... Um, he then emphasizes uh, that they must have morality, they must have concentration practice, and they must have wisdom. He says that if, your, if the concentration uh, is permeated by morality, then it will bear great fruit and great profit. It's obvious, right? Imagine if your concentration is permeated by immorality, you will have great suffering. So he says, your concentration has to be permeated or imbued with morality. Then it will bear great fruit. And that the wisdom which is permeated with concentration will bear great fruit. And when the wisdom has great fruit, then it can remove its stains of sense, desires, of views, of becoming, of ignorance. So he says this. So he repeatedly say this uh, in all these places. Right. So this is, this is the Noble Eightfold Path. So this is the Noble Eightfold Path. Right. Then, in the, then he went to Ambatika, and in Ambatika he said this only, morality, concentration, and wisdom. Then in Nalanda, uh, he also said this, morality, concentration, and wisdom. But in Nalanda, there is this uh, part of the sutta that you have to question, because it was said that Venerable Sariputta uh, raw the lion's roar at Nalanda. And he said that the Buddha is the bestest of all. And that uh, he has removed all his hindrances. And that he has uh, the seven factors of enlightenment. So, but we all know that Sariputta has already entered Pari Nibbana, right? Yeah? In the last months of the Buddha, we all know from the Sutta in this uh, Samyunda Nikaya 14, Uka Chela, where the Buddha says that the Sangha, and Uka Chela huh, is at the north of the Ganges. So it's like far away from Nalanda. And he says that the assembly appeared to be empty without Venerable Sariputta and Moggallana. Right? So we all know that when you read Sutta, you don't sort of accept everything. You, know, you must also be able to be discerning. Right? So that part where there's this lion's roar, you can omit. Uh, you can sort of, uh, okay. So maybe sometimes they pad up the sutta, because it's a long sutta, they want to pat it up, maybe, yeah? right? But then we then go to Patali Gama, and at Patali Gama, it is the place where the lay people uh, offer dana to the uh, Buddha and the Sangha. And there he gives this discourse, and this, this discourse, he tells the uh, lay people this, the importance of morality. He says that if you have immorality, it is wrong. Because your wealth will lose your wealth, will lose your wealth, your reputation, you will lose. 
you will have only shame, you shy when you appear in assembly, and you are not alert at death, and you go to the woeful states after death. So it is wrong. So if you have immorality, this would be your outcome. This would be your outcome. Your wealth, your reputation, you only have shame, and you are not alert at death, and you go to the woeful states. Whereas if you are moral, if you keep to your precepts, if you are moral, then it will be great. Why great? You have gains in wealth and property. Okay? Your reputation will be good. You will encourage confidence and assurance wherever you go and that you will die alert, alert at death and then to the happy states after that. So he emphasised on morality. Right, huh? So it's morality that we can practice. Huh? So this is great. So then we also know that uh, at Pataligama, Suninda and Vasakara, the two ministers, they were building a fortress against the Lichavians and they also offer dana to the Buddha. And after the dana, the Buddha was about to cross the river to Kotigama. And then the two ministers says, whichever gate that the Buddha leaves, you call Gotama Gate. And whichever river that it crosses, you will be called Gotama River. So there's, I don't know whether now there's still these names there, but it's at near Patali Gama. Right, so then now we have crossed over the Buddha, huh? crossed over the Ganges River. There will be people who are looking for boats and uh, rafts. And then the Buddha will just, with his Sangha, just fly across to the other side of the river. Then he says, while others are looking for this, the wise has already crossed the river. Okay, now we are in Lichavian country. Lichavian country, I think, can you turn this, uh, the other side? I think must unlock. So at the Lichavian country, he went to Goti Gama. At Goti Gama, he says, why we are here, for in samsara so long. At Gotikama, he says that it is because we do not know the Four Noble Truths. Not knowing the Four Noble Truths, we come back to samsara to suffer again and again. So that is at Gotikama. So down here, he talks about the Four Noble Truths. So he elaborated eh? the Four Noble Truths, suffering, the cause of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and then the path. So he talked about this Gotigama, at Gotigama, he talked about the Four Noble Truths, and that he again emphasized the morality, concentration, and wisdom. Right. So he says that because we don't know Four Noble Truths, we have been traveling in samsara, suffering again and again. So, it is to say, huh, we must know the Four Noble Truths. Okay, then we come to Nadika. We come to Nadika, and at Nadika, Venerable Ananda asked, Venerable asked the, uh, the Buddha, he says, this monk has passed away. Where did he take rebirth? And this nun, and this male, lay disciple, and this female lay disciple, and then eight others uh, lay disciples. Then, 
After that, the Buddha uh, has to reply Venerable Ananda because this is the pet that they have. The personal attendant can ask any question to the Buddha and the Buddha has to answer him. So the Buddha says, well, Venerable uh, so-and-so, the Bhikkhu has become an Arahant. The Bhikkhuni has become a non-returner. And then the male lay disciple has become a once-returner. And then this female lay disciple has become a stream winner. Then he went on to say about the eight other lay disciples. They have become non-returners. And then he went on to say uh, another 50 lay disciples have also become non-returners. And then he went on to say uh, there are 90 lay disciples who have died and become once returners. And after that, he says there are 500 lay disciples who were stream winners. Right, huh? So he taught, this is at Nadika. Then the Buddha says, do you know if you keep asking me where these people take rebirth, it's actually very wearisome for me. And then uh, the Buddha then say what? I'll teach you a method. I'll teach you the method called the mirror of the Dharma. So that if you know the mirror of the Dharma, then you will know whether you are a stream winner. And stream winner, the Arahant is assured. So he says in the mirror of the Dharma, if you have an unwavering confidence, unwavering, in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, if you have unwavering confidence and that you have an unbroken virtue, unbroken virtue, that means you keep your precepts. So if you have, take your three refuges as you say, I take the refuge in the Buddha, in the Dharma, and in the Sangha. If you take the refuges wholeheartedly, sincerely, then and you have unwavering confidence in the Buddha, his teachings, and the Aryan Sangha, then he says, uh, and you have an unbroken uh, virtues, that means you keep your precepts, that you have stopped killing, you have stopped stealing, you have stopped sexual misconduct, you have stopped lying, harsh speech, slandering, or malice, or gossiping, and that you stop taking intoxicants. Right, huh? Then he says, you are bound to the heavenly realms, and it is to the stream enter, and the woeful states will not be yours. So this is, in Nadika, he talked about the uh, mirror of the Dharma. Okay. Okay, now we go to Ambabali Groove. Ambabali Groove, he talked to the monks about the four foundations of mindfulness. So this is the mirror of the Dharma. Then he talked about the four foundations of mindfulness. So all above, uh, he's always talking about mind, morality, concentration, and wisdom. So these four foundations of mindfulness at uh, Ambali, Bali Groove. And then when Ambabali knew that the Buddha was at her groove, she came. And then after that, she, she uh, offered the meal to uh, the Buddha for the following day. And as she was leaving, uh, she met the youth of the Lichavians, Lichavian youth. And these Lichavian youth have uh, 
they are very prosperous, they are very rich, and they have colour code. So the youths were like dressed in white or in blue. So when they are dressed in white, they have white makeup, white hair, do white ha white hair coverings or whatever, white ornaments, white clothes, white shoes, white whatever. So this whole thing white. And then another will be green or yellow or red. Then this Lichavian youths uh, were coming by and then they met Ambabali Excel to Excel, you know, they carried Excel to Excel. And Ambabali says, Hey, you Lichavian youths, uh, do you know I have invited the Buddha for a meal tomorrow? Then the Lichavian youth said, Hey, you beat us to eat. Uh, uh, can you sort of uh, we'll buy over your dana offering? Then Ambabali said, Oh, not for all the wealth and all the treasures in Vis Vasali, I will not offer. So, then the Lichavian youths are, okay, they are beaten by the mango groove lady. And as they separated, they leave each other, then they were riding towards the Ambabali groove. And then the Buddha says to the uh, monks, if you all haven't seen the devas of the 33, okay, yeah? then look at that Lichavian youth. They look like the devas of the 33 because they are dressed you know, in those sort of colours. You know? So then this is one part where the Buddha then tells the bhikkhus that the Lichavian youths uh, appear to be like the devas of the 33. Okay. Then after the discourse by the Buddha to the Lichavian youth, the Lichavian youths try their luck and try to offer a uh, the dana on the following day. The Buddha says, I have already accepted Ambabali's offer for the meal. And so the, they were disappointed. Then the following day, the Buddha went and the Sangha went to have the meal at the, at the Ambabali's uh, uh, place. And that, uh, after that, uh, she was inspired by his talk. And he, she then offered the groove to the Buddha and the Sangha. So this is the last, this is the last, this is the last lodging, Ruka Mole uh, offering that the Buddha received. So this is the last lodging. Okay. Then after that, the Buddha went to Baluva for the rain retreat, three months rain retreat. And he asked the other monks to also settle in Vasali and the Lichavian country for their rains. During this rain retreats, he became very, very sick and he was like almost dying. But he pulled himself together. And Venerable Ananda, uh, no, said that he was very, uh, he has a lot of caregiver stress, you know, having to look after the Buddha, but that he felt that the Buddha will not die here because he has not left instructions to the Sangha. He told the Buddha that, I know you won't die here when he recovered because you haven't left instructions to the Sangha. Then the Buddha says, instructions, I have already taught with no teacher's feast. So what instructions? I have already uh, taught everything. And then he says that it is because he went into the signless concentration that he felt comfortable. And that he encouraged that beings uh, be their own refuge and take the Dharma as their refuge. Just as he takes refuge by himself. So this is the place where the, the words uh, to the disciples is that be your own island, be your own refuge. Take the Dharma as your refuge. Take, be, take the Dharma as your island. This is where uh, he says that. And he tells that it's very important about these four foundations of mindfulness and that you have to be your own refuge. 
Because you have to practice your own. Nobody can practice or walk your own path. So you have to remove your own taints. Nobody can scrub your taints other than yourself. So in Baluva, he recovered from a grave illness. Then he went to Chapala's shrine. At Chapala's shrine, uh, uh, it was said that Mara whispered to him, he says that, no, you already have accomplished all you have accomplished. Why don't you give up your life principle? And the Buddha says, you know, I remember you came and asked me at my enlightenment to ask me to enter into Parinibbana. But I haven't achieved, you know, the sasana. So, but now, he says, he had bhikkhu, bhikkhunis, lay male, lay female, who are able to teach the Dharma, who are able to explain the Dharma, who are able to refute wrong views. So, because of that, he said he would give up his life principle at Chapala's shrine. So, he says, not to worry, three months from now, he would uh, pass into Mahapari Nibbana. So, then when it, he gave up the life principle, there was an earthquake. Okay? And when Ananda, then disturbed by the earthquake, came over and asked him, what's that all about? He says, then the Buddha says that he had given up his life principle. And then the Buddha, then the Venerable Ananda says, oh, please live long for, you know, live long so that uh, for a century, because they say that those who have developed the four roads to the power, you know, the spiritual powers, they can live up to a century. Then the, the, in, the, in the sutta, it was said that Buddha says, the fault is yours, Ananda, because I've hinted to you many times, and he listed down there 15 times he has hinted to Ananda. But you have not taken the hint, and so he cannot reverse this. You know? He already said that he has given up his life principle. And so now, uh, you also have to think, you know, would Buddha blame Ananda? You ask yourself. So this part uh, where he said that Ananda is your fault. And would Buddha hint? Who will hint? Means you have something hidden in you and you hint, hint, hint. Like you like the clothes and you hint, hint, hint to your husband or to you, whoever. Huh? The thing is that the Buddha has no hidden agenda. So this part where they say that the Buddha blame Ananda is part of, I think it's a later addition. So you think for yourself, this is my, uh, my the way I look at it. Right, huh? Buddha will not... Uh, blame another, right? He's full of compassion and he has his own mind. If he wants to give up, uh, he will give up. But you can see uh, that this, this part of it uh, lead to later students, uh, even when the teacher uh, is dying, uh, then they will ask the teacher to stay long. But then we all know that when we are born, we will die. Okay, uh? so there's no need uh, to sort of beg your teacher to stay. Let conditions be. Just be supportive. If the teacher uh, has not come, you know, uh, has still attachment and then he stay on and cling on to the student, then it may be for his own suffering. So there's no need no, to, you know, to, to do that. This, uh, this is uh, all natural conditions. So this is my own thinking also. So at Chapala's shrine, he gave up his life principle. Then he tells the Ananda, call the monks that are staying in Lichavian, go to the great gabbard hall at the great woods, and I will give a discourse to them. And here he gave a discourse to all the monks, and he talked about the 37 factors of enlightenment. So the 37 factors of enlightenment, we all know the 37 factors of enlightenment. He says, again, uh, we will say seven factors of enlightenment. We also say 37 factors for awakening. 
And what are these awakening uh, 37 factors? So we have the four foundations of mindfulness. Mindful of your body, mindful of your feelings, mindful of your mind, mindful of the mind objects. These are the four foundations of mindfulness. And you must have four right strivings. If there is any unwholesomeness, you have to abandon it. You must encourage wholesomeness. Then you must have the four spiritual bases. And the four spiritual bases is that you must have a desire for the practice, chanda. And that you must have the energy, and you must have the mind or the chitta, and that you must inquire, in, inquiry. You must inquire about, you must question like vimamsa. When you have vimamsa, then you will investigate. If you have a question, you will investigate. So these are four spiritual bases for the practice. You have to desire for the practice. You must put energy and your mind and you make the inquiries. So then, you have the five faculties of faith, of energy, of mindfulness, of concentration, wisdom. And then these five faculties, are, if developed, become the five powers. And then we have the seven factors of enlightenment and then the noble eightfold path. So that makes it 37. He tells the monks, you have to practice and cultivate this, these 37 factors. And it's not that, no, it is something that we do when we practice. We practice four foundations of mindfulness as the basic and we strive to abandon the unwholesome. And we try very hard to walk the path. And during, while we're doing this, uh, we are developing these five faculties so that they become five powers to develop into fully the seven factors of enlightenment and we are walking the Noble Eightfold Path. So it is something that is doable. And not to say that, wow, these are the seven factors, enlightenment is difficult. It is something that can be practiced. So this is the, the, uh, at the Lichavian con uh, country, and then he bade the monks at Vasali uh, goodbye. He says that he had given up his life principle. He will enter into Parinibbana in three months' time. So he bade the monks at Vasali goodbye. Then he moved on. He moved on to four other cities, Bandagama, Hatigama, Ambagama, and Jambugama. And down here, he says, he said, he repeated the same teaching. He says that it is because of not following the Aryan morality, concentration, wisdom, and deliverance. Same thing, huh? That we travel in samsara again and again. So it is because of not knowing uh, this four, morality, concentration, wisdom, and deliverance, that we suffer samsara again and again. Then he went to Pava. At Pava, Chunda, Chunda the smith offered the pig's delight. So they said the pig's delight is truffles because the pigs know how to smell the truffles, the mushroom. So apparently, Chunda the smith offered the uh, pig's delight, after which he, the Buddha had diarrhea. And when the, he asked the Venerable Ananda to get some water from the river, he has to ask three times because Venerable Ananda says that the water in the river has just been churned up by 500 cuts that has went past. But on the third time, because the Buddha says, can you get some water? Oh, then when he went there, the water was clear, sparkling water. So he says the powers of the Buddha. So at the Pava, 
he ate pava, he had the meal, Tunda's offering, Tunda's offering. Then it was say that he met Pukosa. Pukosa, I think. Okay, Pukosa huh, uh, saw the Buddha at the tree and then so talked about uh, his own teacher. And his own teacher was Alara Kalama. And he says this own teacher was so great because he was also seated at the tree and 500 cuts came by, but the teacher, Alara Kalama, did not see, did not hear, but he was fully conscious. Then the Buddha says, I also at one time, there was this heavy downfall and there was lightning and thunder and that there were two farmers killed and four oxen killed. I was conscious, and I, but I could not see and I, I did not see this happening and I did not hear. Then Pukasa said, wow, that is even greater than the Alara Kalama. Because he says, it's, even if it is not 500 cuts, uh, that's not equal to a thousand cuts that ran by, he says, uh, of the powers of the Buddha. And then he became a lay disciple of the Buddha. And he offered two ropes, golden ropes. So this is the last rope. Oh, this is the last food offering the Buddha had. And this is the last ropes offering that the Buddha had at Pava. And, that, uh, uh, and then so he gave two sets and the Buddha gave one set to Ananda. Then Ananda put the rope along uh, on the Buddha. But you see this? The Buddha, huh, the skin was even more shining, more radiant than the ropes. So we all know it's golden plated, sort of golden thread ropes. So he says, the Buddha says that before his Mahaparinibbana and before the enlightenment, huh, he has this, this uh, golden, after his enlightenment, he got this golden uh, sort of hue. So, and then he reminded Ananda, please tell Chunda that the offering uh, is, uh, you know, it is uh, very meritorious so that he doesn't feel guilty that it's because of his food that the Buddha passed into Mahaparinibbana. So can you see here, uh, the Buddha uh, is so compassionate. Uh, how can he ever blame Ananda, right? Right. So then there's this Chunda assurance. Then he went to the river Kakuta and there he bathed and he drank the water and then he crossed over to the uh, Kushinara. And between the two sa trees, he said, lay the ropes there, he want to rest. And then his head was to the north so then we have this untimely bloom where the flowers just uh, fall. And then there's this sandalwood sort of uh, fall onto the Buddha. And Upavana, the monk, was very big uh, and he was fanning the Buddha. Then the Buddha said, please step aside. Then Ananda says, why did uh, the Buddha say to step aside? Because all along, uh, the Upavana was fanning the Buddha. He used to fan the Buddha. Then the Buddha says, there are devas, and the devas are 12 yojanas, means 800 miles, and there is not a needle spot empty, a needle spot empty of a deva. And they said that they came all the way to see the Buddha, to honour the Buddha, but then there's this big, huge monk that's blocking their view. So they say, please step aside so that uh, they can see the Buddha. Then Anura Ananda says, when you are gone, where can we go? So the Buddha says that uh, at, after he has gone, uh, go to the four places, four places. 
the four places above, right, huh, the, the enlightenment, the first discourse, and then the uh, Mahaparinibbana. So then the Ananda then asks his burning questions. His burning questions is, what, what should we do with women? And then what should we do with the Buddha? What should we do with his relics? And then he says, why here? Of all places, he says. So these were Ananda's questions. So we know Ananda was the COO, right? So he must know all these operational aspects of it. So this something, uh, it was Ananda's problems uh, because he was the bhikkhunis idol, a lot of female idol, monk idol. So he always have this problem. He says, what do I do uh, to fem when the women, uh, to how my interaction with female? And the Buddha said, don't see them. If I have to see them, because, you know, if you have to see them, don't talk to them. Okay, but I have to talk to them. Then say, be very mindful. So that's what he say. Then to the question of the body, he says, don't worry, let the lay people take care. But he wants to know. So later we'll talk about how the Buddha says that the body will be treated like for a universal monarch. It will be rolled, you know, it will be sort of covered by 500 layers of linen cloth and then in between cotton wool. Then subsequently, it was put in a vessel and another vessel and then cremated. And the relics will be put in stupas. So that's it. Then after that, the third question, he says, why here? But to me, I said, why not? Okay, uh, anywhere we die, uh, you know, three months are up. Just like a river flow. Okay, stop, stop. So anywhere we die, is it? But then the Buddha says, this is the place. So I'm not very certain this has been uh, sort of added, but this is the place. He says that Maha Sudasana was uh, the great monarch here. And that's why he has, and in the following sutta, this is 16, right? The following sutta, 17, uh, is talking about the great monarch. And that he had died in this place uh, uh, seven times. The last time was as the great monarch. And the eighth time here is as the Buddha. But I'm, I, I, uh, we just take it as that, okay? Then it goes on to say that he continued to ask the bhikkhus. He says he leaves instructions to them. He says that he has no successor. He says, let the Dharma and the discipline be your guide. This is very important, the Dharma and the discipline. And then it mentioned that the minor rules are to be, uh, rules uh, are to be abandoned. Then he says, then we says that the Brahma Danda for Chana. Notice, uh, only one line, uh, you read the sutta, only one line. Minor rules are to be abandoned. But we remember, like, we, in the seven conditions of welfare, we say ancient laws are not to be abolished. So this minor laws to be uh, abandoned uh, is question mark. Also question mark because there was no elaboration. But the Brahma Danda for China, there was elaboration. Venerable Ananda said, what do you mean by Brahma Danda? And the Buddha says, if China asked for instructions or to be uh, talked to, uh, just ignore him. So you can see, uh, you will question these minor rules. So when there are many schools and the rules are changed, you know, then he says, it's the fault of Ananda for not asking specifically what are the minor rules. And maybe it's these minor rules that the Buddha meant. But we all notice that in the beginning of the sutta, 
the Buddha has said, the ancient laws are not to be abolished. So we can, and for it to flourish and non-decline of the Sangha, they should not be abolished. Anyway, Brahma Danda, then after that he asked, are there any doubts? And none of them have doubts. They have every confidence in the Buddha. So the least among them was a stream winner. Then the Buddha passed on. He entered into Jhana 1 to 9. Then after that, he went back to 1. Then he went up to 4. And then he passed away. Right. So this is, after this, uh, there is a great earthquake. So during this discourse, there are two earthquakes. One is giving up of the life principle, and the other is the, uh, at his Mahaparinibbana. So when it happened, the Brahma says that the all beings die, including the Buddha, peerless, incomparable. He also has to die. Right, huh? And that uh, then there is the Brahma Sama, Sahapati. Then we have the King Saka says, all conditioned things are impermanent. And that all conditioned things are impermanent, rising, falling, the cessation, perfect bliss. And Anuruddha says, breathing in, breathing out. The Buddha is now free. Eh? The mind has freed into by Nibbana. And then Venerable Ananda says, the Buddha had passed away. And then there is this terrible earthquake. You know, he, he, to Ananda, that was the most uh, uh, sort of uh, reflection. There's this terrible earthquake that uh, occurred. So then after that, the Malas came to uh, a door, you know, when they told, told uh, oh, there was this, before he passed on, uh, there was this, uh, this at this, uh, there's Subaida, the last of the disciple. So the last disciple, uh, he came and asked the Buddha. He says, um, there were all these six famous teachers in India. Have they realized? Then the Buddha says, don't have to ask whether they have realized. He says, as long as there is the, don't have the Noble Eightfold Path, then there would not be Aryans. If there is the Noble Eightfold Path, so if there's the Noble Eightfold Path, then there will be Aryan. And so Subhida asked for ordination, and before long, he gained Arahanship. So Subhida was the last disciple. Then, then we come to uh, the funeral. Uh, the funeral. So uh, the funeral, apparently the devas have a role in it. The Malans want to uh, bring the body through the south gate, but they couldn't move the, uh, the body. Then uh, Anuradha says the devas want the Buddha's body to come by from the north gate to the center of the city and then go out to the east to the shrine. So during the seven days, they sort of worship the Buddha with dance, song, music. And then the whole place was filled up uh, with knee-deep coral tree flowers. So when they sort of, uh, they actually, the body, uh, is, they, they actually uh, carried the body, you know. They carried the body. And then when they reached the shrine, they... Uh, no, then seven days later, then they bind the body with 500 layers of white cloth in between cotton wool, and they put this in a vat, an iron vat, huh? and then another vessel. And then they have all this uh, cremation, huh? they want to pyro, they want to light it up, but they couldn't light it up. And Anunrada says that uh, the Deva said, have to wait for Maha Kasapa. And Mahakasapa was at Pava, okay? And, and he, was, he met a Jivika who brought a coral tree flower from Kushinara and told uh, Venerable Mahakasapa that the Buddha had passed into Mahaparinibbana. 
Then one of the disciples, the name also similar to Subaida, and he was an old monk. And he says, Whoopee, the Buddha had passed on. Now we can do what we like. We don't have to listen to him and say, do this, do not do this. We can do whatever we like. So this happened uh, at the Mahaparinibbana of the Buddha. And Mahakasapa was aware of this. And this is one of the reasons why he called for the first Buddhist council uh, three months to be held three months later. So anyway, they make their way to uh, Kushinara and then uh, the Mahakasapa pay respects to the Buddha, ambulate three times, uncover the feet of the Buddha and then bow down. Similarly, the 500 monks did likewise. And then apparently the, the pyro self-ignite. And then uh, when it self-ignite, at the end of it, uh, the, there were just bones only, nothing but just bones. And so the Malian said, the Buddha died in my country. Okay? The relics are to be mine. And then, you know, there are eight. Uh, the Achata Satu, the Lichavins, you know, the Sakyans, Koliyans, they all want a share. But Dona, the Brahmin, says that, you know, the Buddha taught forbearance and harmony. So, divide. So, you divide the, it to, to eight parts, to Rajagaha, to the Lichavins, to the Sakyans, to the Koliya, to the Bulayas, right, huh? to the Brahmin of Vidatapa. And then after that, uh, Dona, so you have uh, the Malans, Pava, Malans of the Pava, Malans of the Kushinara, so you have the eight divided. Then we have the urn, uh, the Dona, the Brahmin who divide, he wants the urn. And then the Moriyas came later, then he, he get the embers, the firewood embers. And then they put them in the stupas to venerate the relics of the Buddha. So this is the uh, Mahaparinibbana of the Buddha. So it's a, a bit of gallop through, but I think the essence is that he wants us to practice morality, concentration, and wisdom so that we can get rid of our things and that we have to practice uh, the precepts and we try to uh, have an unbroken uh, virtue, right? So that the practice uh, foundations is a four mindfulness, four foundations of mindfulness, the 37 factors of enlightenment so that we can break through uh, with Aryan morality, concentration, wisdom, and deliverance. We have an unwavering refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, so that we can be a refuge for ourselves, that we can be an island for ourselves, that we can be independent uh, uh, in our practice. So I think this is the end. I can answer questions. Thank you, Dr. Ng. That was definitely a gallop through the long sutta. We have uh, currently have two questions uh, that I can see from here. Shall we try turn the... Oh, can turn. Okay. Okay, what's the question? The first question is, did the Buddha say that we have two emotions, love and fear? Two emotions, love and and fear. I think in this particular sutta, you know the seven conditions for the uh, welfare of the Sangha, the translated word was modesty and fear. So I just used the usual words called moral shame and moral fear. We, wa we want to have moral shame if we do wrong. We must be fearful of doing wrong. First, we must be frightened of doing wrong. We must have shame so we must have moral shame and moral fear. So th this is what I said. But your question is that what love and what did you say? Uh, are there uh, two emotions, love and fear? Oh, I think there are I more emotions there, yeah. than that. Yeah. So yeah. emotions, so yeah. Pertaining to this uh, sutta. 
I, I think... Maybe the ones that you mentioned was uh, over moral shame and fear. Yes. Yes. Uh, next question. Uh, what is a universal monarch? Oh, universal monarch is a monarch who uh, sort of rule by Dharma. Right, he's a universal monarch that rule by Dharma. So actually it's a next sutta, but I think it doesn't matter. So it is, he ruled righteously, right? So he's a universal monarch that ruled righteously. Okay. By the Dharma. Okay. Okay. There's another question. Uh, Bodhisattva, this set 15, Bodhisattva. Uh, Bodhisattva descends from oh, right. Sita <laughs> into the mother's womb. That is similar to Buddha Gautama and the similar account that future Buddha Maitreya recites into Sita. And uh, is this understanding correct? My question is, is the Bodhisattva residing in Tusida, Tusita and Arahan? Is there mention of Bodhisattva qualities in the Sutta? And implies that beings who achieve Arahanship have no, have choice of parinibbana or choose future rebirth till Buddhahood. Thank you for the wise teachings and guidance. Okay, so uh, at the Chapala shrine, uh, I sort of like skip over some parts. Okay, why I skip over some parts? Uh, because I felt that it is uh, most likely additions. So there's this eight. Uh, so eight con reasons for earthquake. Okay, so they say eight reasons for earthquake. One of it is the, just the physical conditions of the world that has caused the earthquake. Okay, then uh, the second condition was that the, there's a powerful deva of, you know, that can bring about an earthquake. The third, it says, uh, is that from the, the Buddha, from Tusita, heaven goes into the mother. Okay, and then the fourth was that the deliverance or the delivery of the Buddha as a baby. Then we have the fifth uh, as the enlightenment of the Buddha, the first discourse, then the, uh, the sort of the giving up of the life principle, and then the Mahaparinibbana. So they give these eight reasons. Uh, but then uh, we want to question, right, the Buddha... Uh, was a lay man before he became enlightened. So why would the earth quake when the lay person enters into the womb? And that how would a child who is also a lay child, also, uh, he's a lay person, no? he, has, he, da he did things uh, just like any person. He has sensual desires, etc. He says uh, very clearly, uh, when I was a Bodhisatta, before I became enlightened, I have all these sense desires. I have all these five hindrances. I have all these five aggregates of clinging. He says this. So he was as lay as you and I, but born in a, a sort of a noble Chetia family. So if you tell me these eight conditions, I can't buy this right. Because he was a lay person, right? So there's sometimes the sutta when you read, you have to be discerning. You have to say that he hasn't realized, and he himself, the Buddha, before he uh, went to turn the wheel of Dharma, he told them before to the five companions, he says, before I did not say I was enlightened. During the six years of struggle, he did not say that he was enlightened, but now he says, I'm enlightened. So you can see uh, the, this enlightenment, uh, 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 this is the cause of the earthquake. So before that, he was lay. He has sensual desires, etc., etc. So why should the earthquake for, uh, for this conception, for an ordinary conception of a putujana? or of the deliverance of a Putujana child. How, then the Buddha tells us, do not uh, go for 
determination. That means fated. This child is fated to be enlightened. Right? Huh? So he says it depends on conditions. It depends on conditions that you know he strives. If you think that everything is determined, huh? why strive? It's all determined, it's written in the books. It's written in the oracles that it's all determined. All I have to do is sit back. I don't have to strive. But his passing words were strive heedfully. If we do not have energy, you know, Viriya huh, is keep repeating in the 37 factors of awakening. You have to have energy. You have no energy, you cannot reach Nibbana. It's one of the faculty and one of the powers. And he, the, the important thing he says is to strive. If you don't strive, you won't catch, catch your goal. You won't arrive at your goal. You will be just meandering here and there, distracted in samsara. So, and then when they say how oh, that is predicted and all that, nah, it is, the thing is that, does it help in your practice? Does it help? It is a, it's a faith. It engenders faith. But we do not seek, you know, we do not seek huh, when we have Gautama, the Buddha, in our dispensation. The highest honour that we do towards the Buddha and his teachings is to realise his teachings. There's no, there's no need huh, to talk about the Buddhas of the past or the Buddhas of the future. We have already be contented with the Buddha Gautama and his teachings. So we would not be sort of, no, our mind go to the past or that I will uh, arrive in the future. If we have such a mind, when we are in the time of the next Buddha, we might also have a, such a thinking, such thoughts. So all these thoughts of the past and the future should be abandoned and that it is now. We have the teaching now. So we should practice now. We don't have to think about the past or the future. So this may be the, it is for encouraging confidence depending on the personality of the individual that some people require such faith encouragement. But we, after we, we need to see the Dharma without the uh, or no, trimmings or the frills. The, uh about uh, six more questions. And somebody asked about the Buddha. Is it true that all Buddhas must be born in India? When will the future Buddha arise? Okay, just now I answered that question already. Okay. Five more to go. Yes. In cultivation for lay people, sexual urge is one problem that is not easy to handle. What is the right attitude that one should adopt? Okay, the Buddha says uh, uh, in the seven uh, perceptions, uh, he says it's foulness. Okay, uh, so the Buddha tells us uh, that the body, uh, just see it uh, as a bean bag with two holes, right? With inside her uh, a lot of different color beans. So this is one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it uh, is that uh, it's just a, Bucket, you know, a bucket. So last time we have this bucket system and then we have feces inside. Lower part is feces, upper part is vomitus. They have uh, eye uh, wax, ear wax, snot, saliva. Very clean, meh. You put your, this mask on after the day, it's smelly like it stinks, you know. Right. So you can see uh, this, everything stinks. What is so desirable? But this sensual desires is something that is inborn uh, in the uh, being. Uh. So he says that you see that, see it as it is. So when you read the Taragata, the Taragatas, uh, you have a lot of examples uh, of Taras or the monks uh, who were sort of, uh, you know, can be aroused sexually. So there was this monk. Oh, yes, there's this monk. Uh, uh, there's this person, okay, and uh, whatever is this person, uh, he was very, uh, he was a son, a caravan uh, leader. And he spent, and then when he went to a place, uh, he spent a lot on a courtesan, on a prostitute. 
And then after that, he has nothing left. He was wretched. And then he went to, uh, the, to listen uh, to the Buddha. And then he became a, a monk. And then there's another partner, no, a caravan leader also. So he also went to the prostitute. And the prostitute eyed his ring. And he eyed this beautiful ring that she wants to possess. So she tried to get it. And then uh, the, the other person uh, had her slaughtered because she wanted his ring slaughtered and throw her in the cemetery where the first monk was. So when the first monk saw, so it was partly decayed, but there was one part that was very, still very good. So when he saw it, uh, he says, wow, when I see this, uh, I still have sensual desires. Instead of repulsion, so then he had this in mind, and then he tried very hard to overcome it, and he overcame it. Uh, and, uh, uh, and he became one of the Arahans. I think his name was Raja something, Raja Datta in the Theragatta, because he was said to be given by the Rajas, one of the four great kings, because they sort of like prayed for a child. So it was a very interesting story. So if you are not inspired to practice, uh, you just go and read the Theragatas because the Theragatas will tell you uh, of the monks that strive and then they proclaim their anya, their anya, you know, how they overcome their problems. So uh, the foulness uh, of the body is uh, a good practice uh, for people who are very lustful. It's very suitable for sex maniacs, for pedophiles, you know, for those who have sense desires uh, inappropriate, that their, all their minds are filled with sense desires. So when they see that it's actually rotting, and so there are people who have necrophilia who have, want to have sex with the dead corpse. So you see, so they all must see it in a, a uh, at a virgin, then they will be detached from their body. So once they detach from the body, yeah, because the body is very gross, then they can easily detach first the body, then the mind. Okay. What's Thank the you, other Dr. Ng. Was, uh, Dr. Ng, was the pork offered by Chunda contaminated, as some sources say? Okay, there are a few uh, sort of uh, comments uh, about it. Uh. Some people say it is pig's trotters, right? The car or something like that, you know? Some people love the car, so that's one. Uh. Then the others, uh, it says pig's delight, uh, it's a sort of a trophus, a mushroom, right? Uh. So whatever it is, uh, the, he must have cooked it uh, with a lot of love and attention uh, to it. So, the, the conditions uh, for the uh, Buddha's Mahaparinibbana were there. So whether or not it's contaminated, uh, so we all link, right? We all link the food and the diarrhea, that this is the cause. But is there another cause? So we don't know. So we don't want to say anything because they didn't take, you know, food sample. So we just <laughs> leave it alone. Okay? Thank you, Dr. Ng. If a person with terminal illness has already settled all worldly affairs, could he give up his will to live without any pessimism, but just letting things be without seeking further treatment? Would it be considered as a mental form of suicide? Oh, uh, the, okay, I don't... Uh, this will... Uh, uh, to let go. Just this volition to let go. So in the sutta, uh, the man from Atankana Gara, he says that the volition, uh, the 11 doors to the deathless state. Okay, just to finish off with the eight conditions. Uh, I think the eight conditions uh, are padded up. So we all have the eight conditions for earthquake, eight conditions for liberation, eight conditions for mastery, eight conditions for assembly. 
So you also question that because they say eight conditions of liberation, but in this particular sutta, there are 11 doors to liberation. So it uh, contradicts these eight conditions, but there are so many flaws uh, in those eight, 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 eight uh, that I would rather think that these 11 conditions of uh, deathless state. And all these 11 states says is to let go of volition, let go of the will. Volition is will, is volition is intention. So in the 12 DO, we have ignorance, we have condition, uh, volition, intention, consciousness. So when we have let go, we just sort of like if you uh, say that you have a terminal illness, you let go, right? Huh? Then your life principle will just goes off. You're not clinging to anything. Okay, so this is letting go. So this is not suicide. Okay, this this is not the word suicide. Suicide though, require is a killing. So you must have condition when the person is suicidal. You will say that there is a life. You have an intention to remove the life. You have a means. You have already think up of a means of taking the life. It might be hanging, it might be jumping, and you proceed to uh, carry out the act, and the act is completed. So this is killing. So this, it fulfills the five conditions of killing yourself. So these are suicide. But when you let go of the will, this letting go of this mental formation, you don't want any more of this, uh, you let go. So this letting go is letting go of this body, letting go of holding on to the body that is dying, and then it just let go. So this letting go of uh, volition, then he enters into a state uh, depending on his own development. So this letting go is quite different from the suicide. It's not mental suicide. It's just letting go. Let things go its cause. But you don't want to interfere with, you know, you, don't want, you, you feel you don't need any more support. You know, you don't need uh, more drugs. You don't need that. You just need it naturally to die. So that you, the natural death, uh, when it ends, uh, it can be, like it says, breathing in, breathing out. You know, rising, cessation. Cessation, perfect bliss. So there's no more sankara, no more sankara. So we say dukkha sankara. So we have dukkha dukkha ti, which is the body. Dukkha sankara is the mental formations, right? Huh? And then dukkha parinibbana, uh, parinama is the changing. So this dukkha sankara, letting go of the dukkha sankara, letting all go of sankara, letting go of the will. Okay. So this is a, a natural. It is uh, for the person, it's just letting go. So in, the, in that communication, so you have unfinished business, you want to finish your business, you want to say, you know, you leave instructions, so you have settled your problems, settle your issues, your whatever, your will, etc. Then you just let go and that you have done your job. There is, there's no need to hold on to anything, you know, there's no need because this body cannot sustain to do anything anymore. So you just let go. So the thing is letting go uh, is also require the other parties of the family to also let go. So otherwise, uh, there is this clinging, this attachment that is very hard for the being to let go. So there is also a communication says that, well, you know, so the letting go uh, uh, is a practice not only at the last minute, but generally you can let go of things. You can like, no more, don't touch. Uh, what is the practice you have? Thank you, Dr. Ng. Thank, someone uh, said, uh, thank you for the Dharma talk. I have three questions. Okay. So one by one. You mentioned that the Buddha and his company of monks flew across the Ganges uh, River to 
Kotigama, could you please explain as to why Buddha and his retinue was performing flying miracles, whereas in Digger Nikaya 1, he prohibits monks from performing supernatural stunts? No boat at that time. <laughs> <laughs> no boat, ma. You don't want to look for a boat, what? Anyway, you got the natural powers. Uh. He's not performing. There's nobody. To There's see. just the Buddha and the Sangha only. And he can just envelope and then bring them across. It's just uh, elements, mind and elements just move across. He doesn't, he's not, he's not having a showmanship. Good. Uh, is the concept of Sunyata in Heart Sutra or Honeyball Sutta actually referring to the Arupa Jhana uh, number 9 or Jhana 4 or the fourth Jhana? The emptiness, the sunata of the uh, Heart Sutra and the honey ball, he says it's the six sense spaces and the five aggregates. So we are of the six sense spaces. We have eyes, nose, tongue, ears, body, and mind. So these six sense spaces are in constant contact with the six sense objects. Right, huh? In these six sense objects, there's an interaction. Now, if there's lust that comes, uh, then the person is uh, attached to these six sense objects. But basically, uh, we all know that we are in constant contact in that these nutrients, uh, the nutrients of contact, is just come and go, come and go. So one question followed by another question, one question followed by another question. It's just contact, go, contact, go. There is no sustained body. The no sustained object, it, is, uh, it comes and goes, it ceases. But on each contact, there is a five aggregates. Each contact of this uh, has a body, has a feeling, a perception, a mental formation and consciousness. So this sixth sense based contact gives you the five aggregates. But each contact is appearing and disappearing. And so is appearing and disappearing. Like the wind and the clouds and the sky and the sun, then there's nothing substantial in it. You can't catch it. You can't catch the rainbow. You see it for a while. You see the sunset for a while. You see the dawn for a while. It's gone. So there's no sixth sense space and there's no five aggregates. The problem is that you keep yearning to hold on to that beautiful sunset or the beautiful sunrise. But he says uh, to see the impermanent nature of the sunrise and the sunset, but not hold on to it. Do not desire for it, but to see its impermanence and its non-substantiality. So this is the Siddhat Sutra, the emptiness, the sunata is that. Now the fourth jhana is a state, is a mental state of concentration. The ninth jhana, the cessation of feeling and perception, is a result of the maturity of the mind, where the mind sees cessation in cessation of perception and feeling. So this is where you have cessation of perception and feeling. There is no more rupa, right? Huh? And there is no more feeling, uh, but they are fully conscious. They may not have feeling, perception, but they are fully conscious. While they are in there, they don't know, only when they exit. So in the suttas, it tells of entry and exit. So the, those who, are, who cultivate it, uh, they sort of like know how to exit also, emerge from that state. Right? But some of them uh, do not know how to ex exit from that state. Uh, so they remain in that state, uh, where the body is alive uh, for 70 over years. You know, they find some of these monks uh, there in that state, uh, but like not breathing, uh, no breathing, but they still have the vital formations and heat and consciousness, but they have cessation of perception and feeling. So this is not the Arupa world. This is by itself the ninth jhana. So the Arupa jhanas, the Buddha is very clear. It's the formless realms. The formless realm, there is no body because the mind just stays in the state of infinite space 
infinite consciousness, infinite nothingness, and infinite neither perception nor non-perception. So this is the Arupa realms. So it is the same thing. If the mind states, uh, that means the sixth sense base, so the mind arrives at the mind state of the Arupa states. And if they cling to it, then they are clinging to the Arupa states. So when they die, the inclination is to go there. So these states are the seventh and the eighth jhanas were taught to the Buddha early in his practice. But he knows that they are not the terminal, not the end, not the goal. Because after you come out from it, there is still defilements, there is still desires. That, so he says, so the arupa jhanas are not the end goal. It's just feel good without the body. Because this body is a burden, you have to carry it all around. It says it's the four vipers. You have to feed it, you have to cheat, you have to clean it, you have to shower it. So he says this body is a burden. So without the body, it feels real good. But he says that's not the end. You know, that is not the Nibbana. It is to see through this attachment to the Arupa part of it, the peaceful part of it. Of course, it's a higher state than the Putujana state of sense, desires. Right? It's a higher state. But he states that the Arupa Janas is still a factor. There's still the ego, there's still the conceit of wanting to enjoy in those arupa jhanas or in the jhana states. So there's this very subtle self. This subtle self that's not let go. There's still restlessness and there's still, you know, conceit. So there is conceit, restlessness and ignorance still with, together with the rupa jhanas and the arupa jhana. So these five upper factors are of the non-returners. So five lower factors are the ones uh, that the uh, non-returners have abandoned, but they still have these five factors that they have not removed. So, uh, so that's the answer to that. The, so you can figure out uh, what I have answered. So the thinking, uh, uh, there is some uh, problem. There are yeah, several um, questions. Uh, including this third question that asked why uh, Buddha exited at the fourth jhana in, rather than the ninth jhana. Uh, but this person added, it, does that mean his energy is still around? The reason I refer to Buddha's energy is because I have read Ajahn Man's biography in which he said that before his vimutti, he saw several Buddhas, Buddhas. What is your explanation on Ajahn Man's uh, statement that he saw many Buddhas before his attainment uh, or of Vimutti? Okay, so the Buddha is very clear. Huh? The Buddha is very clear that, uh, uh, that there is no more, no more, there's no more rebirth. Okay, there's no more entity. There's no more images. He, there's no more Sankara. So there are many schools of thoughts uh, that still say uh, that the Buddha Rupa is still there. Uh, so these this are, this are uh, um, views. Okay, yeah? And sometimes you want, when you're very attached to certain views, uh, then it appears in the mind. It comes in the mind. So whether or not you can see the Buddhas of the past, uh, whether one can see the Buddhas or path depend on the powers okay, of the being. So that's, this, is, uh, the, the, this is seeing the Buddhas of the past, the Buddha Gautama saw the Buddhas of the past. Right. So uh, now Achan Man saw the Buddhas also. So it's just their power of concentration is very powerful. So that's all I can say. Thank you, Dr. Ng. We shall end the talk here. <laughs> Let's uh, share merits uh, with uh, all sentient beings first, followed by um, relatives and friends. In Anjali, let us invite all sentient beings to participate in our quiet merits. Eta wata cha amhehi sambatang punya sampadang Sabe dewa anumodantu 
Saba sampati sidia eta wata ca amhehi sampadang punya sampadang sabe buta anu modantu saba sampati sidia eta wata ca amhehi sampadang punya sampadang sabe sata anu modantu Saba sampati si dia. Let us dedicate the marriage of participating in wholesome Dhamma activity to our departed relatives and friends. Ida me nyati nang hotu sukita hontu nyatayo. Ida me nyati nang hotu sukita hontu nyatayo. Ida me nyati nang hotu sukita hontu nyatayo. Arahang sama sambuto bagawa, budang bagawantang abiwademi. Swakato bagawata damo. Damang namasami Supati pano bagawato sawakasanggo Sanggang namami Sadu, sadu, sadu Thanks again uh, Dr. Ngi for giving us a wonderful talk and uh, thank you for joining us, brothers and sisters. We will see you uh, next week. Uh, bye for now. <laughs>